Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you do know that I'm going to go home and tell everybody that Fred Moore and uh, Matai Glauber did the warm-up act for me. So it's going to be a great day for me, really. Thank you very much, Paul, to invite me. Thank you to Steve Hunter for not turning up and uh, giving me the opportunity to do this talk. Uh, I think uh, I've been asked to talk about AF ablation during minimally invasive surgery. And I'm pleased to see that uh, Sam Neshef's in the audience because... Uh, uh, before I go into the talks, I do need to mention my conflicts of interest. I am a proctor for Edwards with the Endoclamp, and I do get travel grants for the company that uh, 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 sort of markets Atricure. Uh, the talk outline is primarily to start off with the evidence for concomitant ablation. Uh, when Sam uh, came to our uh, unit to talk about the AMAZE trial, and we're all keen to see the results of that, one of the things we said is we did not want to put in mitral patients into that group. But at that time, uh, they were also included in the trial, so I thought I'll go through the evidence for concomitant ablation. I'll then quickly show the procedure as we do it, and then the real question is whether you deal with the left tidal appendage or not and how to deal with it uh, appropriately, and then just probably one slide of my experience, which is not huge. So uh, fortunately for me, there was a uh, meta-analysis published uh, by Tristan Yan's group uh, just a few months ago, and it basically looked at the... Uh, a surgical ablation for atrial, abla atrial fibrillation during mitral valve surgery as a specific uh, subgroup. Now, they looked at quite a few randomized trials, and I was quite uh, surprised that there had been so many randomized controls done in the last sort of nine years. But as you can see, the numbers are very small. They're not uh, large number uh, trials, so they're probably not appropriately powered. And that's probably where uh, Sam Neshef's group were trying to achieve a better result. Now, there's no doubt that in this meta-analysis that the mortality, the confidence in intervals overlap, but there is a slight sort of tendency to favor isolated mitral valve surgery rather than associated with uh, surgical ablation, but it wasn't significant in the small numbers that there were. Certainly from a pacemaker implantation point of view, there was no difference. And from a stroke risk, again, it was slightly in favor of isolated mitral valve rather than mitral valve and uh, surgical ablation, uh, probably because there's some uh, linear lesions being created in the atrial uh, tissue, but again, not significant in small numbers. Sinus rhythm at discharge, there was uh, obvious improvement in the patients that had uh, surgical ablation. And uh, to be fair, the numbers were pretty impressive. It was around 30% uh, in sinus rhythm if you just did the mitral valve. But it, used to, it was going up to between 50 and 70% in the groups that had surgical ablation. So at uh, discharge, the patients in sinus rhythm were much higher with a concomitant procedure. And that seemed to persist to 12 and 24 months. There were very few patients who were followed up to 24 months, so, but the uh, impact was pretty impressive. Around 60% was the result uh, that they quoted. So on the basis of that, uh, we have uh, gone down the route of routinely offering it to patients. This is a procedure we use, a minimal access approach, as already sort of alluded to. We uh, do use the endoclamp routinely, so we do use a superior vena caval uh, cannulation along with the femoral cannula. We have the three ports along with the left atrial retractor site. And uh, we've actually also started to move away from this soft tissue retractor to the retractor that uh, Professor Perrier was showing. It's a sort of easier to use retractor. Uh, our ports actually are five millimeter in size with the camera coming in. Now this uh, animation makes it all look a lot easier. Uh, I have to thank my fellow uh, David Rose who's come from Italy who did this video for me. Uh, basically we put the pericardial stays uh, keeping a view off the phrenic nerve and once we've opened the uh, uh, pericardium we start uh, dealing with the atrial appendage. And I'm really sorry we forgot to click the 3D button to 2D, so it'll give you a bit of a headache. But fortunately, it's only 40 seconds. So uh, uh, we basically put our pericardial stays, as you can see. Um, uh, as you can see, if you see two needles, it's just a 3D camera. Uh, 
we have to be very careful that we don't apply too much traction on the uh, phrenic nerve in this process. And as you can see, again, we don't open the pericardium too much because we're using the endoclamp and we don't need to see the ascending aorta. Now, I share all the concerns that were mentioned earlier, and I think when you do an endoclamp program, you have to be very selective of your patients, and uh, certainly we are at the moment. The next step really is to uh, find that space beneath the IVC so that uh, you know exactly where the left atrium uh, sort of... Uh, uh, goes towards so you don't make a hole into the right atrium while you open it. I then use the suture just to sort of lift up the right atrium. Uh, once that's been done, we get rid of the fat in the intatrial uh, septum. Now, I think people who do air fibrillation say there's a lot of parasympathetic ganglia there, so it probably has uh, dual purposes. One, to see where to make an incision, and secondly, to get rid of any of these... Uh, uh, ganglionic plexi that might be in this area. Once the fat's been uh, sort of completely taken off and you've identified the intatrial septum and the left atrial uh, wall, we then proceeded to, I think this is where the endoclamp is being inflated and uh, hopefully you'll see the cardiac arrest. Okay, now uh, we go back to the animation because everybody has done Minimally invasive surgery will tell you it's not as elegant as this to get the retractor in and get the position right. I think as uh, Professor Moore says, you have to really spend about five, uh, sometimes a bit longer, getting that mitral valve exposed properly. Once the mitral valve exposure is there, we have uh, these sort of uh, markers. I generally go ahead and do the mitral valve repair first because I think... Uh, firstly, that's the most uh, crucial bit for being there and uh, just uh, try and get this done. Uh, I do consent patients saying that if I'm going to replace them with a mechanical valve, then I probably won't do the air fibrillation because they're going to be on a, a high-dose warfarin anyway. Once I've got all the uh, ring sutures in and we've tested the valve, we select the size of the ring and then we pass the sutures through the ring and this actually helps us give a bit of counter-traction to the mitral annulus. We then you open the atracure uh, probe. This is a newer probe. It's still a bit uh, bulky to put through a small mini thoracotomy. And we do our first lesion just to identify the pulmonary veins. And this is a superior lesion where we sort of uh, place it against uh, uh, from the incision going right down to the superior pulmonary vein on the, right, on the left side. Uh, this is uh, set to minus... Uh, 60 degrees centigrade, I think, and we do it for 120, centime uh, 120 seconds. So as you can see, you end up with this uh, thing becoming a ball of ice. The nice thing is you can then take your hands off. As soon as it's frozen, it's all solid, and you can sort of relax uh, for the two minutes that it takes. It's surprising how long two minutes feels. We then press the thaw button, which is a new uh, addition to the probe, and that actually makes it a much quicker process to get uh, the probe out of the atrium. We then do the next line, which is along the bottom. So again, starting from the incision, going across in front of the left atrial, uh, left side is superior pulmonary vein and inferior pulmonary vein. It's very important to join the two lesions. Uh, if there are any gaps, unfortunately, you can get either flutter or escape rhythm. And I've had to, one patient who's had to go back to the EP lab just to join that uh, segment. Uh, so it's, you've got to be very careful to get this. Again, you get this uh, massive ball of ice uh, sort of at the bottom of the heart. Uh, I will mention one of the concerns when you do this inferior lesion later on. So again, we go for two minutes of this, and uh, you can see the uh, sort of pulmonary vein suction cannula giving you a bit of an idea where the uh, line needs to be. I didn't think I left it this long on this uh, view. As it, uh, is it running? Maybe it is running. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Sorry, maybe I left it a bit long because it's a lovely view of the probe. Again, you get a 
nice uh, ball, and then you finally make the isthmus lesion, which uh, at this particular time, it's quite nice to have those sutures pulling up on the mitral annulus because you can go straight from uh, the previous line to the annulus. And again, it's uh, no problem trying to freeze the leaflet because it, uh, once it thaws, the leaflet uh, doesn't get affected by the ice. Now, generally, this again is a two-minute uh, two uh, freeze. Uh, psychedelic. So uh, once this is uh, done, so those, that's a complete pulmonary isolation, pulmonary vein isolation and isthmus lesion. I don't do any more lines because I'm a fan of uh, uh, the Barcelona surgeon uh, who has done the randomized trial and he basically showed that these lines were nearly as effective as anything else. With mitral valve surgery, certainly you don't need to do the right atrial lesion set. So we stop with the left atrial lesion set. Now, the recent guidelines that came out of the European Association did cover the point about whether we should exclude the left atrial appendage or not. It is a bit difficult to do it from a right uh, minimal access approach. Uh, fortunately, there was a conclusion of the recommendation saying that there was no proven benefit of uh, surgical left atrial exclusion. So, to be fair, I still don't exclude the left tail appendage. It is possible to do a suture closure if you are very keen to do it. But my concern with suture closures are that there are a lot of randomized trials, there are a lot of case series that show recanalization or incomplete closure. And sometimes that can be more dangerous because they are more thrombogenic. So, I don't. Of course, uh, this is a, a video that was sent to me by Etricure. I don't know if it will play. But you can put one of these new atric clip devices uh, through the right side. It's much easier if you do it with a chitwood clamp. I think it'll be impossible with the endoclamp uh, sort of inflating in the aorta. But you can actually pull the atrial appendage a bit like uh, Paul showed in his video. If you can see it, then you can pull it and clip it on. I think it's uh, not for the faint-hearted. But uh, this is my uh, sort of uh, moderate experience say, in MI surgery. I don't know what I was thinking when I picked those colors. But uh, as you can see, I'm doing more last year. For the first year, I did more than 50 cases. Unlike uh, in the, I don't feel like a superstar. I feel more like a revolutionist. I feel I'm predominantly doing my work sort of under barricades and uh, occasionally putting my head up at meetings. Uh, the, uh, I, like I said, I use the endoclamp routinely. I just find, uh, again, a lot to this sort of view a lot more satisfying than having to put uh, plagiated sutures into it. But I think uh, it's uh, different recipes for different uh, chefs, and this works for me, certainly. Uh, certainly, the other thing uh, we're doing increasingly is more tricuspid valve surgery. And uh, we certainly are able to do uh, yeah, the last view, we had about 25% of patients who are having both tricuspid and AF ablation. And it's quite easy to do uh, with uh, bicable snuggers on the SVC and the IVC. And the reason I say that is because I think the next step is probably to do lone AF through this route. Uh, Manuel Castello in Barcelona, the last SCT has presented that he's actually doing a lot of lone AF through a minimal access approach. And these are often patients who have failed catheter ablation, and so they have pericarditis or uh, changes within their pericardium to prevent a cat, uh, sort of MIS approach. Now, cryoablation is accepted as one of the best uh, energy sources at present, and so I think I continue to use it, though there are, uh, the transmurality of cryoablation has never been uh, questioned. I'll uh, mention my experience, which really is only around, it's just short of 30 cases, I think it was 28. Uh, we've done uh, probably about 12 mitral valve repair and tricuspid valve repair with AF ablation. Most of the patients who need both mitral repair and tricuspid repair generally just need rings, so the procedure is uh, often a bit quicker, so the total procedure length doesn't seem to enlarge that much. I only do left-sided ablation. I've not started doing the right-sided ablation, but if I'm going down the lone AF route, that will be a pre prerequisite. It adds about 20 minutes uh, to the mitral procedure, uh, which we have timed just to be sure that it is. I've not had any deaths so far. We've had two patients where we've uncovered a sick sinus who have needed permanent pacemakers post-surgery. 
And uh, I put that at the bottom saying we discharged 25 patients at one year uh, in, in sinus rhythm, but I'm um, very uh, nervous about presenting results because every time I go and speak to my atrial fibrillation sort of EP surgeon, EP cardio cardiologist, he's always of the belief that whatever I do is not good enough. So initially he said ECGs weren't good enough, then now he says 24 hour tape isn't good enough, now he says one year isn't good enough. And so I just sometimes wonder in the AF uh, world where sometimes all the statistics is a bit. Uh, blurred and uh, I found this on a napkin once, uh, oh, sorry, a sort of napkin folder once in America. I thought it makes a lot of sense in certain specialties. I'll mention this uh, complication I had. It was only about three months ago, so I don't have the long-term result, but I'm looking at her very keenly. I think I froze the phrenic nerve accidentally when I put that lower incision. Since then, I've been a lot more careful putting it in. It uh, does make a a bit breathless, so she's a bit better because of the mitral repair, but still a bit breathless on exertion, and it's something to be nervous about. My thoracic surgery colleagues freeze the phrenic nerve quite a lot, and they say it always recurs, so I'm hoping it uh, will come back in about six to eight months' time. In conclusion, I think concomitant AF surgery through a minimal access approach is feasible and is safe. I think both left and right-sided lesions are possible, uh, though I've been dealing with just the left side. I think the left atrial appendage can be dealt with with a new atriclip device if uh, required, and I think there's no doubt that is the best way to deal with the left atrial appendage. And I do think there is an area where we could probably go in, which is lone AF, and pro provide this procedure to patients with very low morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much.